What does digital transition mean? And what makes the concept of transition so important to the process of digitalization of public services? Digital transition is a very popular concept today. However, the idea that products, services, and mediums were going through a process of digitalization was well understood already in the 90s and in the 2000s. Beware, though, present and past understanding of digital transformation are different. The difference consists of the highly transformative potential and knowledge to digital transition on public administration. Everywhere in the world, the post-pandemic plans for growth, prosperity, and resilience are deeply inspired by the idea that the world entered a phase of transformation, and that this transformation is primarily digital. Governments are demanded to ideate, design, experiment, and then implement solutions capable of maximizing the benefits of digital transformation while reducing the risks. In short, digital transformation is a process of transformation of public sector's structures and policies. Hello, everyone. My name is Gianluca Sguero. From 2014 to 2020, I worked as policy analyst at the European Parliament Research Service. I am currently Associate Research Fellow at the Center for Digitalization, Democracy and Innovation of the Brussels School of Governance. And in April 2021, I joined the Cabinet of the Italian Ministry for Technological Innovation and Digital Transition. Today, we will take a look at the impact of digital transition on public administration. I divided this lecture in three parts. I will start by comparing digital transition in a pre- and post-pandemic scenario. Then I will move to assessing the state of the art of digital transition in Europe at both national and EU levels. And I will conclude by discussing the impact that digital transition is having on public administration. This will give us the opportunity to reflect on the key challenges of digital transition in the public sector. I hope you will enjoy the time we will spend together. So, let's start with a question. When did the digital transition of the public sector begin? And to this question, someone will probably answer by locating the start of digital transition in government in the 90s. This could be right. It is in the 90s that digital technologies started to become pervasive in our societies. Others will go back further in time, to the 70s, and they could also be right. The surge of cybernetic uh, experienced in the 70s gave birth to attempts to automatize public processes for a more efficient state. Or you could even argue that digital transformation started 30 years earlier, in the 40s, when electronic calculating machines like ENIAC made their public appearance to support governmental operation. You see, the point I'm trying to make is that we acknowledge digital transition as a process that has been going on for years, and we also acknowledge this process for having changed dramatically the quality and quantity of interactions that we, as stakeholders, have with public regulators. But we often neglect to consider the depth and impact caused by digital transformation. And in doing so, we miss a fundamental point. The pace and depth of the changes brought by digital technology have been uneven. On the one hand, digital technology has profoundly changed the business sector and human relationships. But on the other hand, these changes have not been mirrored by equally significant changes to how policy is designed, implemented, and evaluated by public administrators. And this happens because bureaucracy has been slow at adapting to the changes induced by digital technology. On occasions, bureaucracy even resisted to using digital technology to innovate policymaking. This has been true until 2020. With the global health crisis that exploded in early 2020, public regulators worldwide have been forced, literally, to shift from analog to digital services. And this brutal shift of public service to the digital format has revealed the dramatic divide separating traditional public decision-making and structures from the rationale of digital technology. With this in mind, we can finally dive into the topic we are discussing today. Digital transition is not only a pervasive process. 
It is a transformative process and it is a demanding process. Governments are pushed to rethink completely its structures and policies in order to make the integration between digital transition and public service working. There are two reasons motivating the importance of understanding how digital transition is deployed by public institutions to modernize its structures, workforce, and regulatory approaches. First, by grasping how digital transition works, one can put into question cliché and out-of-date concepts on public sector's efficiency. And this helps policymakers and scholars to understand the potentials, but also to accept the limits of digital public services. Second, looking at digital transition in the public sector proves once again the importance of institutional cooperation. Approaches to digital transition may vary depending on factors like the public administration concerned and budgetary constraints. But the key challenges posed by digital transition can only be overcome with cooperation. Data interoperability is one example. Cybersecurity is another case in point. There are multiple fora for exchange and cooperation on digital transition. One recent example is uh, JoinUp. It's a collaborative platform created by the European Commission to help e-government professionals to share their experience with each other. Let us have a brief look at the basics of digital transition applied to public administration. I will start by looking at the European Union and then I will move to the international level. Within the EU framework, the concept of digital transition is defined by the European strategy for digitalization, it is clarified by the digital compass, and it is assessed by the DESI index. Let us begin with the European digital strategy. In this strategy, digital transition is built on three pillars. The first is named technology that works for the people, and it covers four areas protecting human rights in the digital domain, investments in digital skills, acceleration of rollout of ultra-fast broadband, and expansions of Europe's supercomputing capacity. The second pillar is named a fair and competitive economy, and it covers all aspects related to the innovation in small and medium enterprises and startups, as well as rules on digital services. And finally, the third pillar is named an open, democratic and sustainable society. And this pillar includes two areas. The first is the use of technology in relation to the environmental protection. And the second is the creation of a European protected data space. Moving to the digital compass, we find the long-term objectives to achieve the use vision for the digital future. The four points of the compass are used to identify the main goals to reach over the next decade. First, a digitally skilled population and highly skilled digital professionals. The goal is to have at least 80% of EU population with basic digital skills by 2030. Second, to reach secure and substantial digital infrastructures. This includes the gigabit for everyone and 5G technology. Third, digital transformation of businesses. Here we find two key goals. 75% of EU companies using cloud, AI, big data by 2030, and more than 90% of small and medium enterprises with a basic level of digital intensity by 2030. Fourth, digitalization of public sectors with three goals. 100% of public services online by 2030. 100% of European citizens having access to medical records by 2030. 80% of European citizens using digital ID by 2030. 
Please note that in order to help EU member states to reach the goals set by the Digital Compass, the EU has established that 20% of the Recovery and Resilience Facility funds each country is receiving should be dedicated to digital transition. And finally, the Digital Economy and Society Index. This is the most important index to measure advancement in digital performance of the public sector. The DESI Index is calculated on the basis of a number of indicators, divided into thematic groups, including e-government. Beyond the EU, the OECD is the most active international organization working in the area of digitalization. The OECD indicates six dimensions of digital transition in governments. The first is digital by design. In this dimension, digital is described as a, an embedded transformative element for rethinking and re-engineering public processes, simplifying procedures, and creating new challenge of engagement with stakeholders. The second is defined data-driven public sector. And in this dimension, data is recognized as a strategic asset and is used to generate public value through planning, delivering, and monitoring public policies and services. Third is government as a platform. This dimension is described as an ecosystem of guidelines, tools, data, standards, and common components that equip teams to focus on user needs in public service design and delivery. Fourth is called open by default. And this is focused on making government data and policymaking processes, including algorithms, available for the public to engage with. Fifth is called user-driven and it awards a central role to people's needs and convenience in the shaping of processes, services, and policies. And finally, we find proactiveness. This dimension is described as the ability of governments to anticipate people's needs and respond to them rapidly, so that users do not have to engage with cumbersome processes associated with service delivery and data. Now, as you can see, in spite of the absence of a single definition of digital transition, public sector institutions share similar understanding to the concept of digital transition, as well to its main goals and challenges. What instead may present differences is the implementation of digital transition, and as a consequence, the actual impact of digital technology on public structures. Now that we clarified the meaning and applications of digital transition, we can move to discussing its impact on public administration. As a starting point, we can say that this is an impact of both internal and external relevance. Digital transition affects the distribution, the performance, and the evaluation of work within public administrations, but also impacts on how public services are delivered to external stakeholders. And in order to picture the impact of digital transition on public administration, we will describe it in terms of a challenge. There are actually four challenges to consider. The first relates to public sector's workforce. The second concerns digital public services. The third consists of users' rights. The fourth is about regulatory design. The first challenge concerns the human capital, meaning the public sector's workforce, and it is a very complex one. When it comes about the workforce, digital transition not only has an impact on the skills needed by civil servants, but it also transforms the way administrative work is performed, and it has an impact on recruitment procedures. The complexity of this challenge is well clarified by OECD into a three-dimensional challenge. Let us briefly look into each of these three aspects of digital transition in public sector's workforce. First, the skills. What type of competence civil servants need to possess in order to be meaningful contributors or even drivers of digitalized public service? 
According to McKinsey, by 2030, as many as 375 million workers may need to switch occupational categories due to the disruption caused by digital technology. It means that roughly 14% of the global workforce will be impacted by digital disruption. And public sector's workforce is part of this picture. To meet this challenge, public administration worldwide are currently undergoing reskilling and upskilling programs for its workforce. And these programs cover five broad areas. First, information and data literacy. This is aimed at developing the skills necessary to articulate information needs, to locate and retrieve digital data, information and content. Second is communication and collaboration, and it's focused on developing the skills useful to interact, communicate and collaborate through digital technologies while being aware of cultural and generational diversity. Third is digital content creation, and it's concerned with creating and editing digital content. Four is safety. The goal here is to develop skills useful to protect devices, content, personal data, and privacy in digital environments. Five is problem solving, and this is meant to help civil servants to identify the needs and to resolve conceptual problems in digital environments. The second area of impact of digital transition on public sector's workforce is related to how work is performed by public administrations. We know that the pandemic turned remote working into a standard for the majority of civil servants. Let's look at the data. Since 2009, 5.4% of employees in the U27 worked from home. In 2019, that group increased to 9%. And in 2020, close to 40% of those currently working in the EU began to telework full-time as a result of the pandemic. And this has enormous consequences for the organization of work in private, but also in the public sector. Think about office spaces as an example. With increasing emphasis on collaboration, comfort, and flexibility as design principles to improve within-office productivity, public offices will be likely to be reorganized in order to accommodate flexible working time arrangements. And both the US and the EU are cases in point. Third and finally, recruitment procedures are also impacted by digital transition. Here, the, quick, the key question is, how do we attract the best talents in the public sector? And in this case, it's not just a matter of the skills you need to possess. It's also a problem of remuneration, fair treatment, and career path that will make job openings in the public sector as attractive as those in the private sector. Before the pandemic, the recruitment of public sector workforce in the majority of cases will go through rigorous open competition procedures. And while these procedures would hypothetically guarantee the selection of the best possible candidates, are also expensive and time-consuming. After the pandemic, many governments have embraced the challenge to redesigning public sector recruitment procedures in order to be able to hire new personnel and do so within a shorter time frame. This fast-track recruitment can also help countries to overcome the skill cap challenge. Think about European countries, with an aging population which is estimated to potentially reduce the labor supply by 4% in 2030. And I would like to mention the example of Italy. In August 21, the Italian government launched an online platform named INPA, which is inspired by the model of LinkedIn. Candidates are requested to upload their profiles and then apply to the posts that are made available by public administrations. Let us move to the second area of impact of digital transition on public administration and its relative challenge. This is the most important area and it is directly concerned with the digitalization of public services. Internally, there are two elements to consider. 
cloud infrastructure and data interoperability. The main challenge about cloud infrastructure is to set up an infrastructure that could uptake secure, energy-efficient, and affordable data processing capacities for public administrations. We are not close to it yet. In many countries, both in Europe and beyond, the digital public infrastructure's landscape is heavily fragmented and it suffers from a strong technological backwardness. On this point, it is worth mentioning the GaiaX project, aimed at creating a European standardization forum to define the rules of operation of cloud services from the control of data processed and stored on the infrastructure. Data interoperability is a follow-up of an efficient cloud infrastructure. The goal in this case is to make public databases interoperable and accessible through an API catalog that allows central and peripheral administrations, according to various authorization levels, to draw on cloud data, to process them, and to provide services to citizens and businesses. Data operability is the key to implement the once-only principle. Stakeholders are requested to provide information to the administration only once. One key step to move further in this direction is international cooperation to develop ID schemes that are interoperable across platforms, sectors, and borders. And the recent case of the EU Digital Vaccination Certificate is a good example. In a remarkably short amount of time, all 27 EU countries adopted guidelines on interoperability requirements and then designed, tested, and implemented a EU interoperability infrastructure for the authentication of the digital EU certificate. The digitalization of public service has also an external impact. In order to complete the digital transition, governments are requested to bridge the existing divides in the use of digital public services. According to Eurostat, only 58% of Europeans aged between 16 and 74 have basic digital skills, with a significant impact on how they use digital services. How to achieve so? Through digital citizenship. The diffusion of digitized legal identities may ensure seamless access to public and private services in respect of individual rights. In this regard, I would like to mention the collection of digital identity practices that has been recently published by the G20. The collection select the best practices on EID, and these include management, based on proximity and coordination between delivery and operational actors, usability with digital identity systems integrating with other platforms, of large banks, for instance, public-private funding proposing a combination of governmental funds and external sources, financial institutions and identity providers, for instance, and finally, on data protection, with the aim to minimize and eliminate risks of intrusion and abuse. The process of digital transition of public administration impacts on the area of digital rights. And this area includes three aspects. First is the design of digital public services that have to follow a user-centric approach. Second is a process of digital transition that remains inclusive. And third is the protections for privacy that have to be in place when citizens interact with the public administration through digital means. Let us begin with design service. With the pandemic and the consequent acceleration of digitalization of the public sector, the discussion about the design of digital public services has moved on top on the digital transitions agenda. According to the DESI Index, as of 2019, 64% of European citizens 
had used an online public service at least once. When asked to comment on their experience, many reported poorly designed websites, unnecessarily complex procedures, and wrong timing, for example, online consultations occurring late in the legislative process. Inadequate feedback was the most common complaint. So, the whole point about user centricity is about designing digital public services that are easily available, that are usable, and that are mobile friendly. This makes possible to fulfilling citizens' expectations about digitalized public administrations that are capable to deliver quick, simple, and efficient public services and do so in a transparent and inclusive manner. Let us move to the concept of inclusive digital transition. This means that governmental plans for digital transition should safeguard also the rights of those who suffer digital divides. Nearly 60% of the global population is still offline. And existing biases in digital connectivity may limit access to social and economic opportunities only to those with appropriate technologies while excluding those without access. During the pandemic, low broadband quality hampered the ability for many to use teleconferencing tools effectively and cramped possibilities for students to benefit from online learning. According to UNESCO, even in the world's most developed countries, 10% of pupils experienced issues with accessing digital education. In order to bridge connectivity gaps, governments are requested to address infrastructure bottlenecks in areas with insufficient access by speeding up the rollout of nationwide ultra-fast broadband, and they have to invest more in digital literacy. Third, privacy. In Europe, under the Data Protection Rules, GDPR, Europeans can safely transfer personal data between online service providers and have the right to know how their personal data are being collected. And with the right to be forgotten, personal data must be deleted on request if there is no legitimate reason for the platform or the administration to retain this data. A fourth and last challenge is related to policymaking. The scale, host, and complexity of issues to be regulated on the one hand, and the necessity for public sector institutions to adopt inclusive and adaptive methods in the exercise of regulatory powers on the other, have made of design a priority in rulemaking. Agile approaches seize the potential of digital transformation. The G20, under the Italian presidency, in cooperation with the OECD, launched a survey to learn how G20 countries are responding in a more agile way to innovation and disruption. The 24 respondents to the survey reported intervention on, first, strategic foresight as a key step in the policymaking process to make rules even more fit for purpose. Think about the case of the EU that has a dedicated portfolio. Second, stakeholders' engagement with the creation of dedicated governmental clusters to facilitate the dialogue and information sharing between departments and external stakeholders. The UK is particularly active on this point. Third is cross-border cooperation through the active engagement in multilateral fora as well as bilateral agreements with other countries. Fourth are regulatory exemptions via the development of sandboxes that could promote experimentation and innovation. Italy and France, for instance, have experimented sandboxes in the fintech sector. I would like to conclude by sharing with you three takeaways from this lecture. The first is that the process of digital transition of the public sector is a pervasive, transformative, and demanding process.
It is pervasive because it affects structural and procedural aspects of public administrations, and it also impacts on human resources. It is a transformative process because it sets mid- and long-term objectives for the digitalization of public services and structures. And for this reason, it is also a demanding process. Governments are pushed to rethink completely its structures and policies in order to make the integration between digital technology and public service working. Second, there is consensus about the importance of digital transition in the public sector. At both the EU and international levels, there are clear long-term objectives concerned with the digitalization of public service, digital literacy, data protection, and other cybersecurity issues. Third, digital technology is impacting on the public sector in four ways. First, by transforming the public sector's workforce in terms of skills, organizations, and recruitment. Second, by redesigning digital public services with a focus on user centricity. Third, by guaranteeing adequate protection to user rights and by bridging existing digital divides. Fourth, by introducing new regulatory capacities capable of produce agile approaches. In case you have any questions, feel free to contact me by email. And this concludes my lecture. I hope you enjoyed the time we spent together. Thank you very much for your time.